My uh, topic this morning is the internet that you want. This is, of course, after talking to lots of different folks, uh, trying to figure out what it is that they might want. And uh, we kind of came up with this idea that um, there we go. There were a series of limitations that tend to afflict applications running on today's internet. And I've left off cost because I can't really do too much about the cost not being a commercial organization, but technologically, the limited bandwidth prevents big data from flowing and prevents big data applications. What can we do about that? What can we do about the unpredictable response time, response times that can vary and sometimes be really fast, but sometimes be really slow? What can we do about the fact that the internet was designed to drop packets? It was designed to drop packets because that was the way that you indicated to the two ends that there was some congestion on the line, please slow down a little bit. So actually the uh, protocol says keep sending as fast as you can until the packets start dropping. And then, given that there's a even packet drop rate, stay at about that level. Well, that guarantees you're going to have dropped packets, which means you're going to be guaranteed to have an uneven response time. And lastly, the notion that it's one big flat internet. We're all in the same swimming pool together. Everyone is sharing the same water. Everyone has the same addressing scheme. Any hacker can go and address any other device by mentioning its address. We're all into one big address space, one big data space. When you send um, information out of your home and uh, up to the internet, you're sharing one pipe that is going to simply take as much as the carrier believes you've bought and then drop packets in order to keep you at that rate. So this isn't quite the internet that we want, right? We'd like something a little bit better than that. We'd like to have something that overcomes some of these limitations. I'd like to first address the first three limitations. The limitations of limited bandwidth, unpredictable response time, and sometimes long response times, and dropped packets. What can we do about that? Today's infrastructure is more or less represented by this diagram. We have, uh, I'll start at the right-hand side, the home. In the home, you've got portable devices and things that may be connected over wireless. You have a connection to a, your local ca carrier. The most common is 10 megabits per second. I think in this room that average would be higher, but try to pick a typical number. And then once it gets to the head end of your local carrier, your local Comcast, Time Warner, CenturyLink, uh, DSL, whatever it is, Verizon Fios, you're going to go through a series of routers to the servers in the cloud. Let me just tell you quickly about how it works from my house. I happen to have Comcast service. If I go and ping the Yahoo Finance server, it's uh, right here in Sunnyvale, California. You're sitting right next to it, uh, approximately. It's actually about two and a half miles that way. When I do that, my packets go from Salt Lake City, where I live, to Denver, Colorado, to New York City, and back out to Sunnyvale. And that's just the way that was least expensive for all the folks involved to hand off the traffic and to route that. Do you know what the latency is when you send the traffic from Salt Lake City to New York City back out to Sunnyvale? It's pretty long and creates a lot of latency. And worse than that, all of these hops create a number of places for the packets to be dropped. Remember, the internet is designed to drop packets. So everybody along the way is busy doing that. Now, I've only drawn six routers here in this path, but in the one I was just telling you about, there's actually 32, 32 routers in that path between my home and the Yahoo Finance server in Sunnyvale, and that's not unusual. I just picked it because it happens to be good for testing. As you know, when you um, try to test response time, you need different information each time because your browser will cache things. So I could use the finance server to go and put in different financial symbols and therefore get different results from a uh, common website, and that made it easy to do measurements. So this is the infrastructure, and this explains why those first three limitations occur. What can we do about it? A number of you, a number of cities, 
have taken a big step and made that last link, instead of 10 megabits, a gigabit. We've got the Gig City Chattanooga, we've got Google Fiber, we have uh, Utopia in Utah, we've got Let's San Leandro here in this area, local sponsor, and lots of folks have looked at that last bit and said, okay, we'll make that a gigabit. And with a gigabit, you can get a big fat pipe to the first of those 32 routers. But we have a weakest link problem. The weakest link problem is that once we get it into the rest of the internet, they haven't yet tuned it for our gigabit end user access. If you go to uh, Kansas City and get on Google Fiber, the biggest disappointment is that things don't load 100 times faster. Why not? Because of all the stuff that's still upstream. So what can we do about that? If we would like to have faster response times, what we're going to have to do is to put the servers that provide that response time closer to the end user, sometimes called edge computing. So if you put a server at the head end of a gigabit network, that server at the head end of the gigabit network suddenly has a clear gigabit right to the end user, right? Everyone's going to be a lot happier when they see that happening. And remember that the gigabit does two things. First, it allows you to send much larger traffic. So if you're sending multiple HD 3D streams or you're sending models like we saw last year with Engage 3D, you have the bandwidth to do that. But the other thing is that the clock that sends those bits out is running 100 times faster, which means that the amount of time from that server to your home is I'll use math incorrectly, 100 times less. It's not 100 times less, those of you who know math, but you get something that's much more responsive because the latency, the, the time between it sends the packet and you get it in your home, is 100 times less for that packet because it's being clocked out faster. So the gigabit gives you two things. It gives you that bandwidth, but it also gives you much lower latency. What can much lower latency give you? much more responsive systems that involve closed loop controls of many kinds. Gentlemen sitting here at the front table know exactly, they, they can give this part of the talk. Probably give the whole talk, but uh, at least this part has been one that you've really made a, a, a big a deal about, and I agree with you completely. So I think that this combination of having a local server and the gigabit to the home is a very powerful combination. The local server means you can use all of that gigabit to the home in case you are sending big data. It means that anything that you're going to need to get a fast response time from, something faster than you could get from a typical web in the cloud, you can get back very quickly because, again, the latency to that local server and back is very much less than it is if you're going to go through the 32 routers up to the remote cloud. Does everything need that? Of course not. There's a lot of things that uh, if you want to go look at the front page of the New York Times, you're perfectly happy to wait a second or a second and a half to go get it from a remote server somewhere in the cloud. But if you're watching a 3D printer in a remote city and you've got a 100 frame per second camera, see, I was paying attention, then you actually do need this kind of low latency to be able to make that happen appropriately. So I call this locavore infrastructure. Why the word locavore? First of all, you're in Silicon Valley and California, lots of great fresh food here. They like to eat local. But when you look up locavore in the Merriam-Webster dictionary, it says locavore, one who consumes fo foods grown locally whenever possible. And I think we should be consuming compute and storage cycles locally whenever possible because that's going to provide for a better user experience and that's going to address those first three limitations of the internet that I talked about. So this locavore infrastructure, especially when you can ignore the upstream stuff, is going to provide for excellent apps. You're going to see some really terrific apps, both on stage and in our App Expo today, that take advantage of this really low latency, big bandwidth, which means very rapid response from a local server. 
and I think it's an arrangement that we'd all like to have in U.S. Ignite cities. Where it's appropriate, and there will be many applications where you don't need that very low latency, or you don't need the big bandwidth, and you can go to a remote server. And that will end up being, at least for right now, a little bit less expensive because of the massive efficiencies of the big, massive remote data centers. But over time, I think that the economics is really going to switch. I'm just going to go about two sentences into something very technical, but some of you will understand this very well, which is that carriers are beginning to put in these servers in their head ends anyway for their own purposes. It's called network functions virtualization. And if you want to know any more about that, Chris Coleus, where are you, Christos? He's, he's here someplace. He promised me that he would be happy to talk to any of you today about network function virtualization. Since these servers are appearing anyway in the head ends, why don't we use some of them to run these, uh, these applications, what I would think of as US Ignite applications. Here's a complicated uh, log log diagram that goes and shows you across the bottom kilobytes, me uh, megabytes, gigabytes, terabytes, petabytes, and up the left-hand side, it's, it's also a log scale showing the time frame. And so the amount of data that you can transfer is uh, shown uh, for a gigabit by the dotted orange line. You can send more information in more time. Uh, on the left-hand side above that is a solid orange to white line. That's a 10 megabit line. And you see that it has a couple of uh, steps in it. That's because at the lower end, the response time that you can get, even for small amounts of data, is limited by all that relaying through small routers. And so that's limited. Uh, and, but once you get over to about a half a second to a second, then it goes up linearly until you hit usage caps. And usage caps, of course, also limit what you can do. So the white area is the commercially available stuff you can do today. You can just go make that happen anytime all day. The orange part is what you're all innovating in. That's where the really interesting stuff is happening. And over on the right is the gray. That's the terra incognita. I love that phrase. It's Latin. It means the unknown land. And they used to put it on maps when they didn't know what kinds of land might be on the other side of an ocean. It was terra incognita. Well, that's unknown for us because we don't know what kinds of apps might be able to run there. But what we are all engaged in is moving things from that white area into the orange area. And that orange area will continue to move to the right as new technologies become available to make that happen. And it does two things, as I said. One is you can take the same amount of time and send much more data. So that's kind of the big data arrow. You can move things into the orange area, taking the same amount of time but much more data. But the other one, which is also really valuable, is you can take the same amount of data and move it in much less time. And that's also really important. Uh, if, if any of you, you're looking at this, some of you are taking pictures of my slides. If you would like to, there is an app that you can load from the iTunes store if you have an iPhone called On the Same Page. And if you load the On the Same Page app on your iPhone, the slides that I'm showing here will show up on your iPhone, and you'll be able to see them directly. And as you know, on the iPhone, you can also take a screenshot of your iPhone. So you can have an exact copy of my slides that you want to have a copy of from your iPhone right now, right in front of you, if you use the On the Same Page app. That app, by the way, was done by our friends at the University of Tokyo, Aki Nakao and Company and uh, is a terrific example of how to use um, Wi-Fi to broadcast information to a crowd such as we have here at the US Ignite Summit. So remember, two things. You can either send uh, more data in the same amount of time, or you can send the same data in much less time. This uh, slide shows a number of the applications we've got in US Ignite. They're in that orange area, which means they're taking advantage of the higher speeds and or the lower latency that uh, are present either because of the speed of the line alone or together with the Locavore architecture. Okay, so upstream. What can we do about upstream? What we can do is that right now we have a series of distributed decisions being made by routers heading traffic upstream. And that set of distributed decisions is not always optimal. 
I told you about one non-optimal scheme that's happening between my house and the Yahoo Finance servers. What we can do with software-defined networking is have controllers that look out over the entire topology and make intelligent decisions about what to do to reduce that time. They can also do such things as send out multiple copies so that you could have a much more reliable experience and overcome some of that packet dropping that I talked about earlier. And there are a lot of, there's a lot of work going on right now in this upstream SDN world. Um, I've put up the logos for just a few of the controllers that are available, uh, Pox, Ryu, Open Daylight, and there's others. If you came to the uh, Extreme uh, Open Innovation Challenge workshop yesterday, you saw, I think, three different controllers there. And um, there's going to be another controller on a workshop Friday for the home that uh, Suman Banerjee from the University of Wisconsin is going to be talking about called Paradrop. But there's a lot of work going on to optimize these streams so that instead of having 32 hops, there are many fewer hops. And in fact, here in this uh, show floor, we've got some optimized streams running software-defined networking over Internet2 and the Genie network that the Internet2 network is supporting. And uh, Scenic, of course, is the local California education network that's also supporting this. So when you take a look at these first three limitations, the limited bandwidth, the unpredictable response time, the drop packets, we actually have a new infrastructure architecture that can help with that. It's using Locavore, which is gigabit, plus local cloud, local genie rack, local server, plus using optimization on the upstream part, on that long distance part. Can really answer those first three things. But what about the last one, the one big flat internet? This is a haven for people being able to play man in the middle attacks, impersonations, DNS attacks. How do we attack this one big flat internet? How do we get rid of root poisoning and, and all the performance issues that this one big flat internet has? Well, there are some things we can do there too. Using the new virtualization technologies that are often linked with software-defined networking, we can take the physical infrastructure, which you see on the bottom, and you can go and turn that into several virtual clouds like you see on the top. Now, those are not physical networks, those are virtual networks. It's just like if in a data center you have a physical server, that would be at the bottom, you can virtualize it and have a lot of virtualized networks on the top. And you can see that Susan's medical information is being protected. It's in a separate container. It's protected health information. Uh, if uh, we're doing some remote surgery, and you're going to see an example here later today of simulated uh, remote surgery for training, you also want to make sure that it has adequate time performance. So you see the little clock there. That particular cloud is going to get priority to be able to have very low latency. And of course, we'll still have ordinary internet too. That's still going to be there. So this customized virtualization can really se segment the pieces of the internet, what Chip Elliott calls channels. You can have different channels for the internet that allow for separating these things and giving them different kinds of treatment appropriate to those particular applications. And I think that that's really going to be the answer to the one big flat internet. So that's the formula that I, that I think is going to come about in the next few years. We're going to see locavore computing, which is gigabit to the end user, server at the head end, community servers, plus upstream SDN optimization. And by the way, just earlier this year, AT&T announced that they're going to be doing SDN optimization upstream. Google is already doing it. They're the biggest user of upstream SDN optimization right now. And then with customized virtualization, which you're going to see several examples of here at the um, uh, summit today and tomorrow, I think that we can really address these limitations. So US Ignite communities, I encourage you to think about adopting this kind of enabling infrastructure. First thing that many of you have already done is get gigabit to the end user. You need that as a foundational layer. Having the, the other stuff doesn't make any sense unless you've got adequate bandwidth to the end user. So, you know, find those folks who will put in fiber, who will put in gigabit wireless. Find ways to do that. That's a foundational layer. But then, take a look at the Locavore infrastructure, which is adding local servers. 
Uh, Genie has deployed 58 Genie racks to communities across the country. Get those Genie racks connected to your local gigabit infrastructure. That gives you the Locavore piece. The Locavore piece makes a big difference. Beyond that, I'd like to see more SDN intercity connections. We can do that using facilities from our regional networks, networks like Scenic here in California, and from Internet2. They're already doing this. In fact, it was either just this week or last week, I'll have to double check which, Internet2 made available its 100 gigabit backbone for programming by people like you. You can now program SDN national backbone 100 gigabits to do new applications. So that's something that we can build on to make this tier two happen. And I'm hoping that all you communities, in addition to having the gigabit, in addition to putting in the uh, Genie servers or other local servers, connect that up through your local research and education network or through Internet2 or both to be able to make sure that we have these SDN intercity connections. And once we have that, I urge you to think about customized virtualization so that we can go and take this different sets of traffic and treat them in ways that are appropriate to that particular piece of traffic. I think that's the formula that we'd all like to get to. Tier four, the gigabit to and from the users, I've just listed here five of the apps that you're going to see in the App Expo or on stage these two days, today and tomorrow, that depend upon having a tier four infrastructure in your city. These apps work because of that. Tier three, the Locavore infrastructure. A lot more of these apps demand low latency and or high bandwidth that that Locavore infrastructure can provide. This is the list of apps that you're going to see again in the App Expo or on stage today and tomorrow that the Locavore infrastructure enables. That is gigabit plus that local server. Tier two, you're going to see some interesting intercity apps. The uh, Thrive um, Pollution Monitor Act that David Lowry is going to talk about is something that is inherently uh, an intercity app because we have pollution that moves from place to place. Taking a look at how that pollution moves is very important. Cybersecurity is a service reaching out to provide a forensic analysis in a different city. This SDN intercity app to provide low latency intercity connections. And what's very interesting to me is you're actually going to see three customized virtualization apps. Universalized virtualized application is uh, from the University of Idaho in a city called Ammon, Idaho. They are installing a tier one infrastructure with gigabit to the end user, local server, the ability to go and provide customized virtualization on top of that, uh, and be able to go and provide a connection to the home that provides differentiated service. They have a nuclear facility upstream to provide reverse 911 to every home with guaranteed performance, no matter who's playing an Xbox game, is very important. So you're going to see that customized virtualization from the head end to the home. In the home, Suman Banerjee is going to talk about his Paradrop home router. That Paradrop home router is capable of customized virtualization. You can write apps for it. So now we've got a box that we can have in the home that would match up potentially to what the folks in Idaho are doing to get to the home. And you're also going to see from Jakobus Vandermeer at the University of Utah, the ability to go and take an Android device and to put secure sandboxes within the Android device and link them up over a customized virtual network for secure medical record access. So think of it. We've got everything from the head end to the Android phone this year in three separate applications, but maybe in some future year, a seamless end-to-end -end customized virtualization application. That's, I think, a place that would provide lots of value for lots of people. Uh, we're going to have a series of demos here that are just terrific. I just wanted to color in some of the countries that are showing demos here at the uh, US Ignite Summit. In addition to the United States, we've got the uh, emergency response team from uh, Canada. We've had a student fly in from India to produce one of the demos. Is that student here who's, who's flown in from India? Yeah, stand up, please. Thank you for coming from India just for this. And you're going back right after the summit. Is that right? 
So somebody, he gets the award for coming the longest distance. Thank you. <laughs> We have uh, quite a great team from the University of Tokyo. Where's the University of Tokyo team? Yes, thank you. And anyone who's looking at the um, On the Same Page app, that's uh, thanks to them. They've done all that magic stuff, and you can see that world slide that has Japan colored in right there on your iPhone uh, to be able to do that. Uh, and uh, from France, we're tomorrow going to have a uh, company called Sigfox that does a new kind of wireless networking, and so uh, they're colored in as well. It's been really great having all of those folks available. Let me give you just a quick uh, tour of what's going to happen here today. Uh, I'm going to be immediately followed by some big data demos that I think you're going to find very interesting and very impressive. We're then going to have a short break and then have a set of collaboration demos. Over lunch, you're going to have a chance to go and see the App Expo that we've got here. And the App Expo folks, I think it's going to be just terrific. There's a number of things that are, in my mind, even better than you're going to see on the main stage, but they just weren't appropriate for a main stage. They required you to really interact with them to make a big difference. So I really encourage you to see all of those. And also during that time, of course, the Juniper demo is going on. And so get your time for the Juniper demo as well. We have a very interesting announcement to be made at 3 o'clock, and then a panel on US Ignite Communities Making News, sector roundtable event, and then a reception that's going to be right here. And together with that, we're going to have a repeat for the App Expo for any uh, people who would like to go and demo their apps beyond that. Tomorrow, uh, we have a workshop from 8 to 9.30, which is on the um, uh, Genie Experiment Engine. It's a really easy way to get apps up on a Genie Rack. And as you know, a Genie Rack is a great choice, I think, for a Locavore server. So this is a great way to get up apps easily on your Locavore server and begin writing Locavore apps. We have some interesting keynotes tomorrow. I think that you'll really enjoy Larry Peterson. Um, a, a lot of my ideas have come from others in the industry, including Larry. And I think that you're going to see, from his point of view, what he thinks about all of this. Uh, we also have Gigi Sohn from the uh, Federal Communications Commission. Cue up all your questions for Gigi. He'll be interviewed by Alex Wilhelm. Uh, she will be interviewed by Alex Wilhelm from TechCrunch. So that should be very interesting. Short break, we'll have advanced wireless demos. Uh, over lunch, we're going to have a panel on engaging developers. Another demo session on smarter things a panel on moving past beta. How do we get these things into commercial production service? Because US Ignite doesn't want to just show it can be done. We'd like to see it being done. Uh, we're going to have a computer history museum reception tomorrow night. If you've not been to the computer history museum, this is a treat. You need to go and uh, visit the computer history museum. After I visited the first time, I decided to become a member, even though I don't live in this area. It's just that wonderful and worth supporting that I do that. Uh, Friday, we've got a workshop on Paradrop, which is this home programmable SDN router. We're very grateful to Suman Banerjee, University of Wisconsin, for making that all happen for us. So uh, with that, I'd like to turn the program over to Bill Wallace.